my students who are logging in um, from webinar. I've got three here. I'd like to thank um, Gussamer Enterprises for coming to talk to us about malolactic fermentation. If you remember last week in my class, that's what we talked about all week. So this is great timing actually for the webinar. So the students should have a pretty good background on what's going on. Um, I'd like to thank Brian for introducing us and getting us introduced the speaker and I will let Gussamer take it away. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and yeah, I, I also want to quick thank uh, Michael Moyer uh, as well for organizing this. I don't know, Michael, if you want to do a short introduction before I kind of hop into my little spiel, you're welcome to. Yeah, sure. Well, Brian, no, th Brian, you know, you reached out to me to want to do this um, webinar on the malolactic fermentation. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, it's obviously the less well-known fermentation. It's the less uh, well understood fermentation. And so it's good to get some uh, clarity and some insight on the process. Uh, it's not quite as well understood. And, um, and uh, Brian is the technical sales rep here in the Midwest covering Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Illinois. And Brian reached out to me a few weeks ago to put this together. So thanks a lot for doing that, Brian. I appreciate it. Sure. Happy to. Thank you again for, uh, for uh, partnering with us to, we could do this. Um, yeah. David and I have been working on getting this going here and um, with Chris as well. Um, and uh, we're super excited. So I'm Brian Forbes. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm the technical sales rep for Michigan. I also cover Ohio and Illinois and Indiana. Um, I've got a wine background um, in the wine world since 2008. Got a, another degree in winemaking. We've done, I don't know, 18 harvests or something like that over the years. Uh, and now I cover the whole beverage side of things for Gusmer for that territory. So wine, beer, distilling, juice, um, so on and so forth. And um, thank you all for joining us. We've got uh, David Spector here from Christian Hansen. And uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a bio that uh, David presented to me. Uh, David Spector started out his winemaking career as a 17-year-old looking for a way to access alcohol. After joining a winemaking club in his hometown of Philadelphia, he knew this passion would become a lifelong quest, pursued an undergrad degree in economics, and then a handful of vintages around the world, earned a master's in enology from Cornell, and worked in a variety of functions, uh, winemaking quality, Lean Six Sigma, sales for large winery groups like Gallo, Constellation, Vintage Wine Estates. Um, has acquired a number of entertaining stories about the wine industry that her, he may or may not share with you. It sounds like he's probably going to at some point here today. Um, currently works with Christian Hansen and travels the world to assist wineries and brewers with fermentation expertise. If not traveling, he can find working from home or at his favorite coffee shop in Venice Beach, California, where he lives with his wife and his cat. I can safely say that uh, David is a very valuable resource um, and, a, and a great partner with Christian Hansen. So, um, with that, I'm going to hand it off to him, and he's going to be providing the bulk of our presentation. I'm going to jump in a little bit here when we start talking about nutrition a little bit later on, um, and uh, we'll probably have a, hopefully, a lively discussion about some questions and answers and things like that. So uh, thank you all again for joining us, and take it away, David. All right. Thank you for that introduction, Brian. It's good to be here with you all and it sounds like you had a good introduction to malolactic fermentation so i'd like to take a non-traditional approach to starting a presentation and begin with a, a story so as you know humans have been making wine for thousands of years and we're going to go back in time so that i can tell you a miraculous tale about winemaking now, I, I know what you're thinking, not that story about Jesus turning water into wine. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you isn't found in, in any book. We're going to go back to the 1980s, which is, in fact, a recent phenomenon when you think of the vast timeline of winemaking. In the 1980s, Christian Hansen, uh, the leader then and still now in bacteria fermentation, for dairy uh, formed a wine team. They had recently successfully converted the dairy industry from using starter cultures to freeze-dried direct inoculation cultures 
for cheese making. And so they thought they could do the same thing in wine. And so they hired a dynamic duo. First, there was a gentleman named Klaus Pra. He was gregarious, a lover of French wines, spoke six different languages and played multiple musical instruments. They also hired a gentleman named Jan Claire Nielsen, uh, who you probably uh, have read about in many malolactic fermentation research articles. He was introverted, he was methodical, bespeckled, and really a brilliant researcher who collected hundreds of bacteria samples from wineries and universities around, around the world. 20 years earlier, a researcher named Ellen Garvey in 1967 published a paper, which I'll share with you all if you're interested, which spoke about the new species Leuconostac enos, which we call Enococcus eni or Enococcus eni. I'm from Philadelphia, so uh, with my accent, I prefer Enococcus eni, but it's up to you. Uh, here in this paper, you can see that researchers from uh, Dr. Kunke at UC Davis and uh, Pinot at Bordeaux University had collections of Leuconostac enos. And as a former employee of Constellation Brands uh, with an office at, at Woodbridge, I often heard rumors of Mr. Mandavi driving down uh, from Napa to Davis to pick up his slant of bacteria from Dr. Kunke at UC Davis. But the researchers and everyone else knew at the time that wine bacteria was different than those used for, for dairy and producing bacteria, concentrating it, freeze drying it, and then having it convert malic to lactic in wine after direct inoculation, just, it just wasn't possible. It wasn't dairy. But our dynamic duo didn't believe that. They knew it, it could be done. And through exploration and through understanding uh, bacteria and the research, they, get, they got to work. And so they set off every day in this laboratory at Christian Hansen. You know, they were the, the Maverick wine team. They put them in, in a corner. And so they would be smoking cigarettes and building a collection of strains, bacteria strains, that would fill two dusty old freezers. And I, I often wonder if they knew the effect that their work uh, would, would have, you know, especially because they were just a stone's throw away from where Emil Christian Hansen isolated the first pure cell of yeast in Copenhagen at Carlsberg Brewery, just about a hundred years before. And so after a few years of work, they, they finally did it. They had successfully made a product that could withstand the freezing process yet was robust enough to work in the harsh environment of wine after direct inoculation. And it was good timing because Bordeaux was having a very, very difficult year. And it was a cold and, and wet vintage and malic was high and none of the wines were going uh, through firm, uh, malolactic fermentation. So Jan Claire and Klaus, they went off to Bordeaux. They weren't met with palm leaves and exuberation. In fact, most of the, the winemakers and the researchers uh, didn't want anything to do with these, these two hippies. Uh, they would go from chateau to chateau with their magic powder um, but winemakers were hesitant. You know, the researchers, uh, the folks at the university said, you know, you can't freeze dry uh, malolactic bacteria and then expect to add it to, to your wine. And, and who's going to take that chance? You know, some of these wineries, the chateaus, are first growth chateaus, millions of dollars of wine, and uh, they didn't want to take the chance of putting some some bacteria in their wine. But Luckily, uh, Klaus and Jan Claire were able to convince one first growth chateau 
to uh, let them experiment and let them put this bacteria in all of their wines. This first growth chateau with an American accent uh, was run by an American princess. And she said, okay, young Claire and Klaus, you can inoculate my wine, but you have to come in the middle of the night because word traveled pretty quickly in Bordeaux and she wasn't just gonna let them walk through the front door. So young Claire and Klaus, they sneak in around midnight and they inoculate all of the, the tanks, all of the barrels. And a couple of days later, malic has started to degrade. And just a few weeks later, they get the call that malolactic fermentation had been completed. They were able to blend the wines. They were able to sulfur the wines. They were able to chill the wines uh, before that, that winter. And where it got around, winemakers, they are not having any of their wines go through malolactic fermentation, but this one chateau completes all their wines. Something wasn't right. So they started clamoring. They went to the university and they were able to work with Christian Hansen to distribute and disperse this freeze-dried bacteria so that all of the wines in Bordeaux that year went through malolactic fermentation. And it was just a, a few years after that uh, where it was globally accepted that winemakers had this tool that they could use to complete malolactic fermentation with commercially isolated bacteria. Okay, so now that you have been introduced to uh, that story, I think it's going to be good to talk a little bit about our approach at Christian Hansen. I want you to know that we don't take a reductionist approach to winemaking. Yeah, we're gonna talk about malolactic fermentation today, um, but we don't just focus in on, on one element, but rather the fermentation process holistically. This is another visual of the traditional fermentation process. Obviously, this is a sequential inoculation, but I think it shows the rise and fall of different microbial populations quite nicely. And we're gonna to touch on the topic of inoculation timing a little bit later in this presentation. If there's one thing that I want you to take away from this presentation is that all Enococcus eni strains are not created equally. We have some strains that produce more diacetyl. We have some strains that cannot produce diacetyl. We have some strains that work really well at low pH. We have some strains that work really well at high ethanol. I think the best example is to compare it to Homo sapiens. For example, I'll compare myself to a football player. And I know you're in Michigan and I don't know who's the quarterback of the Detroit Lions, but I'm from Philadelphia. And so I'll use Carson Wentz as an example. You know, Carson Wentz and I were both part of the species Homo sapiens. I may be a bit better looking than Carson Wentz, but he can probably throw a football further than me. So same thing with Enococcusini. All <laughs> strains of the species are not created equally. So in the next three slides, I'd like to outline what we mean by malolactic fermentation, how it takes place, and why have malolactic fermentation in a given wine. So what is MLF? It's an enzymatic decarboxylation by specific lactic acid bacteria, predominantly Enococcus eni. But what does that mean from the wine's perspective? Well, one, it decreases the wine's acidity as lactic acid is a weaker acid than malic. And two, you're gonna have changes in the organoleptic profile of your wine. So that might be in the form 
uh, the production of diacetyl, acetic acid, modification of, of esters. And then finally, MLF makes your wine more stable. As the bacteria consume available nutrients and removes a fermentable substrate, uh, which will mitigate against spoilage organisms. I'd just like to define uh, terms here. When I say malolactic fermentation, what I'm referring to are all the elements of the malolactic fermentation. That's the decarboxylation. That's the changing in the aromatic properties of the wine. That's the stability issue. Uh, when I use the term malolactic conversion, I'm talking just about the L-malic to the L-lactic. Okay, so just a quick note on spontaneous MLF. Uh, we all know that one could conduct malolactic fermentation with indigenous bacteria from your grape and perhaps winery equipment. And of course, some of the most famous wineries in the world do that, um, but there are, are risks that you should be aware of. And one is, is speed. You know, do you wanna finish your malolactic fermentation before winter? So you can chill your wines and SO2, your tanks and, and barrels, something to think about. Uh, there could be unwanted sensory compounds from other microbes. You, know, you could uh, have them produce acetic acid, ethyl acetate, bread off aromas. And then you know, some of the indigenous bacteria can produce biogenic amines. Uh, our bacteria strains cannot produce any uh, biogenic amines like, like histamine. In a, a recent study that we conducted with uh, many of our customers around the world, we found that a lot of the quality issues that they were concerned about could be mitigated with proper malolactic fermentation uh, management. That includes high VA, uh, that could include bread off aromas, uh, some of the vegetal uh, green aromas and flavors that winemakers could be uh, concerned about. So to better control uh, your fermentation, we need to know about our main character. And yes, this, this creature does have curly hair because um, I, I thought for continuity, having the presenter and the main character of the story having curly hair would be useful. Uh, this is obviously a simplified visual. And so I don't want you to think that the four uh, stress factors that I have listed here, temperature, SO2, pH, they're not the only factors that will affect your enococcusinae, but uh, they're the ones that we've highlighted that are of our main concern. And I want you to know that uh, they, can they can enhance each other's effect. You know, for example, if you are conducting a co-inoculation and your wine has a temperature spike, you know, say you get to 88 degrees Fahrenheit, your bacteria might be able to survive that if the ethanol is low. But if you have a wine at 12, 13, 14% ethanol and your wine reaches above 77 degrees Fahrenheit, now you're gonna have uh, an issue. That's gonna be very, very difficult on our Enococcus eni. So now we're gonna take a a look at the nutritional requirements of Enococcus eni. Uh, this is the part where I jump in a little bit here. Um, so, you know, any any student of winemaking knows that nutrition is pretty important for your yeast. Um, and if you if you don't have appropriate yin, if you don't have appropriate vitamins and minerals, and so on and so forth, you end up with problematic ferments. Um, same goes for malolactic fermentation. And, uh, you know, 
I think anybody that's that's been through uh, a long, slow mallow um, can can probably relate to the fact that it's kind of stressful because you want it to get done, you want it to get done quickly, and you want to put sulfur in there and rack things off and put them to bed for the winter so you can go home for you know a week at Christmas or whatever you're going to do. Um, so one of the things that is an important consideration with nutrition for malolactic bugs is if you're in a situation in your primary ferment where you're already devoid or low on nutrition, um, and also if you're using a really high nutrient consuming yeast for your primary fermentation, you can leave uh, a pretty uh, devoid um, wine uh, nutrient base for your malolactic uh, to take place. So that's something to consider if you're using a really high um, nutrient consuming yeast um, and you're already maybe on a low yan setup or other stress type grapes uh, situation. Uh, that's something to very closely consider uh, thinking about adding some nutrition for your mallow. Um, if you are dealing with some uh, strains that also don't lice very quickly post primary fermentation or if you're immediately racking off of those lees after primary fermentation, you're also limiting the nutrition factors that you have for your malolactic. Um, Enoch Akazini is kind of unique in the wine world because yeast can store some level of nutrition, bacteria can't. Um, so it's taking it purely from the substrate that it's currently residing in. Um, so that means that providing some nutrition can really help ensure that you have a good, successful, fast uh, malolactic fermentation. And that's one of the things that we do at Gusmer is uh, nutrient blends and our microessential xenos is the thing that we recommend for that type of situation. David, could you kick to the next slide? Um, so David mentioned, you know, a couple of stressful situations that compound themselves in each other uh, when you're talking about malolactic. So high alcohol, high SO2, very low pH, extreme temperature ends, right? And uh, I know certainly in Michigan, you'll have some interesting pHs sometimes um, and even some interesting alcohol sometimes. And of course, depending on the yeast strain and depending on how hard people have been hitting things with sulfur, uh, you might also have some sulfur issues uh, to contend with some sulfite issues. And going with that, um, <laughs> they do compound each other. So you can end up in a really hostile environment for malolactic. So, Going back to David's uh, bit about Bordeaux and having a really tough year with high malic. Um, and if you've already got your alcohol and maybe you've already got some SO2 uh, and maybe your pHs are low, you're really in for a, a tough time. Um, and, and certainly some varietals, you know, Merlot and Zin are prone to that. Um, some hybrids on the other side are not prone to that and will try to go through mallow if you just give them any sort of chance. Um, so knowing what you're dealing with, knowing the history of your grapes, the history of your winery too, um, are, are really important to see if you're going to have a difficult time, or if you're going to have an easy time. Um, I, I don't know, some of you have probably worked in wineries, uh, that have house strains that, uh, take off right away. I know Michael and I were talking about this a little bit last week. Um, and I've certainly dealt with this over, over my career, whether it was intentional or not. Uh, mallow went off on its own. Um, but I've also been in other wineries where it was mallow and PDO and a couple of other things. Uh, and, you know, you end up with some ropey wines that uh, are a giant problem later on, or you end up with a heightened risk of Brett. And uh, generally people don't want Brett. So it's very important to understand what your situation is uh, in terms of nutrition. If you're monitoring your yans, if you're having good clean fermentations for primary, um, you're, you're probably going to be in a fairly decent situation for mallow. Uh, as an insurance policy, adding some, uh, some nutrients for mallow specifically can really help you go through. Back to you, David. All right. Thank you, Brian. So just to follow in what Brian was saying about wine being a stressful environment for Enococcus eni, um, we've outlined some of the, the conditions here for malolactic fermentation, you know, what's difficult, what's favorable uh, for, uh, for your bacteria. And obviously to 
to some degree, you have more control over the temperature of the total SO2 in, in your wine. So you certainly want to use those levers to ensure that your malolactic fermentation uh, goes through. Now, I'm, I'm a big fan of transparency. So I'd like to share a little bit about how we screen and how we produce our, our bacteria, Christian Hansen. We are looking for strains that are unique, that are robust, and we need to get strains from nature. You know, they have to be from grapes or from must or, or from wine and the winery environment. So we're often you know, going to different parts of the world to, to find these, these strains. So we have six production plants in the US and in uh, Europe. Our production plant in the United States is located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So not too, too far. Perhaps Brian can set up a, a field trip one day once we're allowed to meet in, in, in person. And in today's world, in today's environment, I think it's very important that you know uh, where your ingredients are coming from and, and who is supplying what you're putting in, in your wine. And we take that very seriously at Christian Hansen. And we've been named uh, the most sustainable company in the world in 2019, based on uh, how we produce our strains and the impact uh, that our bacteria cultures and uh, to a, a certain degree, our uh, yeast cultures uh, have an impact on, on the world. The fermentation process is, is very much like a wine fermentation. So I think if you went to our production plants, you would feel at, at home. Uh, there's large tanks. If you uh, look to the, the right, you know, maybe the, the sanitation is taken with a degree of, of seriousness that I, I have never seen at a, at a winery. Um, but we are focusing on producing biomass. And then we freeze and freeze dry our uh, products depending on the customer's needs. And we keep them in freezers. Now we have, and so does Gosmer, uh, many uh, large uh, freezers where we can store our, our products before customers use them. Uh, Gosmer then ships these products throughout the country uh, so that winemakers uh, can use them uh, during, during harvest. And our products are always able to be used uh, directly into, into wine. So I'd like to chat a little bit about what makes Vinaflora special. You know, all of our products are of course ready to be directly inoculated into to wine, but we also test you know, every batch for their ability to convert malic to lactic, which we call the MAC test. Other quality control measures, which, um, take, which we take to the next level um, due to the sterile needs of the dairy industry um, include contaminant analysis. You know, do you have any uh, yeast and mold? Do you have acetobacter? Do you have any other non-lactic acid bacteria in your product? Uh, this is all uh, tested and shared uh, with, with customers. And then uh, we also measure and communicate about the, the magic number. And what is, what is the magic number? Well, the magic number is a million cells Per milliliter. And we believe that that is the number of cells needed to start malolactic fermentation. Not all products on the market are going to deliver this magic number. And that's really important to know because Enococcus eni or eni uh, grows so slowly. You know, where Saccharomyces cerevisiae can double in a matter of hours, Enococcus eni can take days. So that's why it would take much longer to complete malolactic fermentation 
uh, if you use other products or if you cross seed or if you go uh, spontaneous. Uh, here I have just some, some data from an experiment in Australia. And that's showing uh, the difference in time with direct inoculation, which we always promise that you'll get the magic number, a million cells uh, per milliliter versus a cross seeded or using a mother tank um, and then, then spontaneous. So uh, if you're interested in having your malolactic fermentation done uh, quickly, then you really want to think about how many cells you are adding to your, your wine. So I'd like to talk a little bit about a different timing. So we're going to focus in on co-inoculation and why uh, you may want to uh, use this mechanism uh, for, for your wines. I know it's uh, quite popular now um, and it could be appealing to, to folks in the Midwest. You know, you're gonna save time. You are going to save money because you might be able to utilize uh, the heat from your primary fermentation, you might be able to have better uh, control and you also could enhance fruitiness of, uh, of your wines. But, you know, it's very important to choose the right timing. We defined at Christian Hansen at Guzmer, uh, early co-inoculation as meaning about 24 hours after uh, the yeast inoculation, you add your bacteria. And then co-late inoculation, late co-inoculation is, uh, occurs about one third through your alcoholic fermentation. And it's not really about the, the bacteria, but about the application. You know, is your wine matrix right for co-inoculation? What type of wine are you hoping to produce? Those are things that you need to think about um, and certainly can reach out to, to Brian uh, to, to walk through. Here's just another visual showing you uh, the timing um, when the populations are peaking in co-inoculation or sequential inoculation. Uh, we oftentimes don't talk about reverse inoculation because uh, here in North America, we can't use lactobacillus plantarum uh, before a, a yeast fermentation. But in other parts of the world, uh, that is a tool that winemakers do have. And I think the most important thing is, you know, make sure you monitor uh, your temperature. You don't want to uh, have your, your bacteria experience high temperatures over uh, 77 degrees. This is just a, a very simple table that can help you decide whether co-inoculation might be right for, for you, um, what type of co-inoculation you wanna pursue. Again, uh, this is something that Brian uh, can certainly uh, help you with if you have more questions about co-inoculation. To finish the presentation, I'd like to just talk a little about, a bit about specific strains that might be of interest to to you, to winemakers in the Midwest. Uh, I'm originally from Pennsylvania and oftentimes when I was studying in Ithaca, it was a bit heartbreaking to see all of the research, all of the data uh, happening in Australia, in California, in Europe. And what works there may not work for your wines, for your varieties. Uh, for your conditions. So part of me telling that story in the beginning was a bit of a call to action. Uh, Lake Michigan College you know, has all of the vinifluor bacteria strains and I, um, I challenge you to experiment, to work with Brian, to expand our knowledge on how our products work within uh, your, your wines. So the first strain that I'd like to uh, chat about is Vinoflora CH11. So this is a strain that was isolated from a starter culture uh, from a winery in Germany. So 
they would use this particular house strain in Rieslings and Pinot Noir, and it works really well at you know, low pH. And I think that is really uh, where it, it shines. So if you have wines with low pH and you want to conduct malolactic fermentation, this can be a great tool. It's, it's made to be used at, at low pH. All right, so the next strain is CH35. This is our main diacetyl producing strain. If you're looking to produce a certain style of Chardonnay, this is a tool that can, can help you. If you are producing a barrel fermented red wine, this is another tool that could, could help you because you know, even if you don't want that, that buttery aroma in red wine, that diacetyl aroma threshold is much higher than in, in Chardonnay. So it can really be a, a powerful tool to um, give your wines more body, more mouthfeel. And then finally, we have Vinoflora Cine. Uh, this is a very good strain if you want it to have all the benefits of completing malolactic fermentation, you know, maybe it's stability that you're concerned about. This is a strain that's going to put your wines through malolactic fermentation, um, but it cannot produce diacetyl. So I see a lot of winemakers using this uh, for their white wines or their rosé wines. Uh, this can uh, certainly, certainly uh, help. And with that, I am going to end the presentation. We are now going to take some time to answer any questions uh, that you may have on malolactic fermentation, on Enococcus eni, and I'll just allow any of the other presenters to say any uh, closing remarks. David, thank you very much for, uh, for going through that. Um, and thank you all for uh, listening. So if you've got any questions, um, of course, uh, Michael and Amy, if you want to hop in on anything too, feel free to. Do you know how much, I know citric acid concentrations are pretty low in wine, but do you know what, on the order of things, what they are? Because um, I'm thinking about that citrate negative strain that you just finished off with. David, do you want to hop in on that one? Yeah, um, I, don't, you know, I'm on video here. I, I don't want to uh, state a um, amount of, of citric acid in, in wine that is in, incorrect, um, but, but certainly uh, different wines from different areas can have a bit of uh, variance. And Enococcus eni, um, will sequentially prefer malic acid over citric acid. So they will certainly uh, consume malic um, before uh, then moving on to the, uh, the citric. Does the citric remain a sub, but the citric with them would potentially remain a substrate for another bug, right? But That is correct. Yeah. So definitely an interesting one, the citric. And that's something that we can look further into. Um, yeah, do you, any sort of metabolic pathway issues or something like that that might be also throwing any sort of citric or anything like that around. Um, but uh, yeah, I know certainly from my experience, there are some varieties that do have, you know, just a little bit and the stability issue, you know, coming off of it, if you're sterile filtering or something like that, you're, you're, you should be, as long as you're sterile filtering properly and bottling properly, be fairly stable. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, um, we do have one question hopping in um, from Stephen. Um, any general comments on MLF super hardy U of M hybrids? Yes, no, it depends. Um, and I can, I can speak directly to that because uh, I actually worked for the U of M for a little while and um, did a, a couple of years working with the hybrids. Um, <laughs> You can definitely use these with the cold climate hybrids or the super hardy hybrids as they're called. Um, 
and uh, it really does depend on the chemistry. Um, again, sometimes you're dealing with really high malloc on some of these things. And so uh, if you want to get things through all the way through malolactic, you really do need a good start and a good strain uh, to get them through. Plus, you're going to be dealing with, you know, pretty extreme pHs in some cases. You know, if it's front neck blanc, you might be 2.8, you know, and you might have a TA of 16 or 17. Um, and so having a really good inoculation to give you a really good start is really key. You don't want to have a struggling mallow um, that's just going to sit there and kind of stick and, and not do anything. You know, you're essentially throwing your money away at that point. Um, the the CNA is something that has always been really interesting to me with the the hardy hybrids uh, simply because if you're trying to do you know rosés out of things or if you're trying to keep a really fresh lacrescent or something like that uh, and still do some acid mitigation and some stability um, the CNA can really be a good tool for that um, you know some of your hyper aromatic whites you know gewürztraminer is another really good example not that you're ever going to really need to mess with your ph or something like that with the gewürztraminer um, but if there's some reason that you do have a low ph aromatic white whether it's riesling or you know one of the frontenac family or something like that and you don't want any chance of diacetyl you can still do some of that really nicely hope that answers the question um, and and David, any other comments on that at all? No, I think you, you handled that well. Okay. Cool. We've got another one here. Um, is there a situation that may be beneficial to add ML to the juice prior to yeast fermentation, specifically for cider production? Great question. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a, a, ton, of, a ton of experience uh, with uh, cider production. Um, you know, perhaps it, it could be helpful. You know, it, my understanding of, uh, of, of cider production is that, you know, a lot of cider makers that I've talked to want to, you know, retain that acidity. And so they have been a bit hesitant to, um, to conduct uh, a malacolactic conversion uh, because of, uh, the reduction in the, the the acidity. So, you know, I've actually had more conversations about, you know, how to produce other acids. You know, whether that's through a non-saccharomyces yeast like Lachantia thermotolerans that can, you know, perhaps convert some of that sugar into in, into lactic. But I'm uh, certainly interested in uh, working with folks and learning more about, you know, how these products uh, can be used. In insider fermentations. Uh, yeah, certainly. I, I mean, I think David's spot on in terms of cider. Um, one thing that I've spoken with a couple of people at this point about is the early inoculation of mallow bugs um, for sparkling production. And I know David and I have chatted about this a bit. Um, that's that's one of the, the primary interesting points of in a reverse inoculation for mallow bugs is if you're doing sparkling production because you can complete your mallow um, before you even start in a primary and have a, a, a more successful primary fermentation, uh, faster, cleaner, because it's not as a hostile environment. Um, on cider production, that would be interesting, um, you know, dealing with the primary acid being malic, you know, so if you're tweaking your acids other ways or um, that, that might be a really interesting thing to play with. I hope that answers the question. Um, I was going to ask about related to that, because um, I know you were also talking about the co-inoculation, which I think is really interesting. Um, and these are kind of related, one's a related question to a comment is that I would be concerned about, especially if you're doing like a pre malolactic fermentation, I'd be really concerned about VA production, acetic acid production because of the sugar um, and a lack of an and an in an aerobic and potentially aerobic environment. Um, and so I wonder, the other question I was, so like here in the Midwest, we oftentimes have, end up with lower alcohols. So um, in the finished wine, so stock alcoholic fermentations aren't nearly the problem that they are in the West. Um, and so I would be less concerned about doing a co-inoculation 
um, in an alcohol with the uh, alcoholic fermentations here. But I'm wondering, do you know a lot of people in the West by chance who are doing a lot of co fermentations um, with the higher with the higher bricks juices? I will speak based on on my experience. And I have seen in the last five years, a lot of wineries and winemakers move to co-inoculation. And the reason why they're doing it may be specific to their, their needs. You know, I often will go into a winery and there's different success metrics for malolactic fermentation. And for some winemakers, some wineries, uh, it's all about sensory. That is the most important. Uh, for some wineries, it's all about speed. And for, for other <laughs> winemakers, they may have their own uh, success metric. And maybe it is to reduce VA. The biggest move to co-inoculation that I have seen is for, for speed. And that is to uh, have wines that are moving along the process uh, rather quickly. And they understand that there may uh, be certain trade-offs uh, with that move to, to co-inoculation and there's uh, certain benefits. Uh, one of the things uh, that some of the larger wineries see in the Central Valley uh, that you know, perhaps a smaller winery in the Midwest may, may not have this issue, it, it's contamination of uh, microflora on winery equipment. A lot of the large wineries in the Central Valley of California um, are still using screw press. It's something that I had never saw other than in a winemaking textbook. And there's a wide variety of bugs that are growing and thriving on these, these screw press. And so what some of these wineries were finding was that they were inadvertently inoculating all of their wines uh, with a bunch of indigenous bacteria. And so they found if we co-inoculate, um, we can actually have malolactic fermentation conducted by the bacteria that we're, at, we're, we're buying. And we know what it is and you know, not some uh, bacteria that you know, perhaps is contributing to ropiness or to to, to, mal, um, to, to mousiness. The other benefit was that, you know, if you're doing co-inoculation, you don't need to buy nutrients. You know, as those yeast die, that, that's providing the, the nutrients that the bacteria uh, need. And so they were able to get a faster malactic fermentation. Uh, they believe that it was in an effort for uh, bioprotection. Uh, the wines had less chance of um, being mousy and but uh, correct or not correct some winemakers in the in the valley and in many places believe that uh, malolactic fermentation should be conducted in the presence of oak and so if you're doing a co-inoculation that's something you have to to give up correct and you know so there are some 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 trade-offs uh, that that folks will will have. Yep. Well, sir, of course, you're fermenting in oak. Just throwing it out there. If you're knocking out the head of a punch and or doing a roto fermenter or couve or something like that, mm. you know that's a a fairly small scale thing typically, rather than the, the big guys in the Central Valley. Um, Michael, coming back to the the risk of VA if you're reverse inoculating, um, I haven't really come across anything that would elevate the VA risk if you're going right before your ferment. Um, because theoretically you're outcompeting your, your you know, VA producing bugs, right? By pitching, uh, by inoculating, right? Um, and so theoretically you're in a fairly hostile environment for, for some of the other bugs that are gonna give you a bunch of VA, right? So some of your lacto and some of your PDO and all that kind of stuff. Um, so if you're directly inoculating it, you're, you're doing some bioprotection on its own, right? Like Dave was talking about, um, and you shouldn't get much VA production. And especially with some of these strains, they're very low VA producing strains. So you should be able to. We, we've been doing, we've been doing a lot of, you know, metagenomic analysis and 
uh, even for folks that are doing the co-inoculation, that bacteria is you know there and is, is a lot of times laying uh, dormant. It's not producing uh, the VA um, that you know some people warn about. You know, obviously it depends on your your wine matrix, um, but you know I have not been able to consistently see that you know co-inoculation uh, will result in a higher VA because of the the different variables. Uh, that you know we might see in a sequential versus co-inoculation, but definitely something to consider uh, when deciding, you know, your, your 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 timing. Yeah, I was always I was always taught that, and I've actually witnessed too that pretty much microbial growth of anything in the presence of sugar, except for yeast, is bad news most of the time. And the reason why you can get away with it with the co-inoculation is because there's so much carbon dioxide present that there's no way that any oxygen is going to get con in contact with the fermentation. And so there you're protected. But I would be, personally, I would be a little bit nervous to do a pre-ML fermentation for that reason. I would, you know, co-inoculation, I, I still, and in fact, I forgot, I, I'd kind of forgotten about it because, you know, I've never really done it. And then I, a couple of years ago, I was like, oh yeah, we should try that. We should try that. We should try that. And then we never did it. And then I kind of forgot. And then I'm this presentation I'm reminded to do it. So I think maybe next year we'll give that a try. So. Right. And, you know, it, obviously it depends on, you know, knowing the history of you, your wine. You know, if you know you have a difficult time, uh, getting the wines to go through malolactic fermentation and you have a long fermentation where, you know, you might see some, some VA spikes, you know, perhaps it, you know, would be superior to, to go co-inoculation, but uh, uh, not as, as clear cut as I, 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 you know, would like to, it to be. Cool. So we did have a, a chat question come through. Two types of red wines making St. Croix and Marquette didn't add the MLC until after the second fermentation. Is this too late? They seem to be losing their bite. Used RC212 for both. Um, I'm hoping you might be able to clarify um, the second fermentation part. Um, I'm a little confused there. Uh, but you know, generally, if you haven't sulfured everything pretty heavily, it's not going to be too late to add your mallow bugs. Um, if things haven't gone through and you haven't sulfured things, um, you should still be able to do a full sequential inoculation at that point. Um, I hope that helps answer the question. Um, but even if, you know, you've, you've fermented your St. Croix and your Marquette, you've pressed them off and you've racked them, um, and they're sitting in barrel or tank or wherever they're sitting, um, as long as you haven't, you know, done a heavy hit of sulfur or you know, add a lysozyme or something like that, you should be okay to, to add um, Malibugs at that point. Um, Camden tablets. Okay, so Camden tablets at the stemming and crushing. Okay, so that's your sulfur dose. And if you were able to get through primary, you should be okay to get through your mallow as long as you haven't added any more post ferment and racking. Um, of course, your, your total I guess sulfur that might be left in there could be inhibitive if you do have a lot of sulfur and sulfite in there uh, remaining from the, the ferment. But RC212, from what I remember right, and definitely not an expert on it, but doesn't tend to throw an enormous amount of sulfur and be mallow inhibitive. But um, yeah, from know. what I remember, RC212 is actually a super low sulfur producing strain in general, so it shouldn't be enough to inhibit um, anything when it comes to MLF, so cool. it should work out well. Excellent. Um, I, want, I wonder if the losing the, the wine, if, if uh, the, the person asked the question is, losing their bite means um, like, you know, softening of the, I mean, that's a kind of a natural product of the malolactic fermentation. You know, the, sometimes a 
pH shift upwards and uh, lowering in the titratable acidity, that would definitely, you know, that's what I would associate with losing its bite. And that might be a good thing, might be not such a desirable thing, depending on where you're starting out, I guess. But mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just echoing what, what you said there, Michael, losing the bite, to me, it sounds like you're starting to go through mallow. Uh, if you're getting a nice little whiff of yogurt, um, then you then you know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, not as bitter at the end, seems to be mellowing out. Yeah, to me, it, it might be going off on mallow. And I would do, if you're doing chromatography or if you do an enzymatic or um, an FTIR, I'd keep an eye on it and see what it's actually doing. Because um, it might be going off on its own. Um, or if you did add mallow earlier on, it's probably taken hold. Uh, that's, that's one important thing with with things going through malolactic fermentation is that, you know, from a sensory standpoint, um, you can really completely change the character of the wine. You know, you go from having a, a really harsh tannic red, you know, maybe a green cab franc type thing. Um, you go through mallow and all of a sudden your pH changes, your la your acid profile changes. And then all of a sudden it starts impacting your tannin structure and your entire mouth feel. And then you do start getting some of that diacetyl character coming in and rounding out the palate even more. Um, so that's a really important thing that, that goes on with malolactic uh, fermentation. Um, I, I know certainly if you've, if you've ever given a barrel tasting of a big cab or something like that to someone after you just pressed it, you know, it's pretty rough. You know, <laughs> most of the time you, <laughs> you have someone that's never done a barrel tasting before and they uh, don't particularly care for it or they pretend that they care for it. Um, until it goes through mallow and has some time to polymerize and, and chill out a little bit and, and kind of, uh, you know, settle down as it were and get some micro oxygenation happening too. Um, so that's all kind of intertwined. Um, and then mallow is a really big part of that process. I hope, hopefully that helps answer that. Um, that I actually did bring up lysozyme there. Um, and Michael, we were discussing this the other day. Um, lysozyme, if you are trying to control your malolactic fermentation, it's actually a really useful tool. Um, it's also really useful if you've got some manky grapes coming in because uh, <laughs> it wipes out all your, your, your bacteria, your gram positive bacteria. Um, it will still leave acetobacter, so you can still get uh, some serious VA problems if you're not careful. But uh, it'll control your malolactic bu uh, bugs and a bunch of other stuff too. So if you're trying to, for example, play with your Chardonnay style and you wanted to go through partial malolactic fermentation, you can, you can do that. Um, if you find a character that you like, you can do something like lysozyme um, and essentially stop malolactic fermentation, or you can do you know, a couple barrels with this, a couple barrels without, uh, and then blend it back together and sterile filter them. Um, so as a stylistic, tool um, using malolactic in conjunction with something like lysozyme can be really uh, helpful and interesting. Um, um, does anybody else have any other questions that are uh, itching to be asked? We've got a couple of good ones there. Amy orchestrating in the classroom. <laughs> oh, I had to see if anyone here had any questions. And, sure. Yeah. Excellent. On this end. Yeah. Excellent. But yeah, you know, hopefully, you know, the students, the the winemakers there in in Michigan and, and elsewhere, um, if you, you have any questions, you know, Brian is a is a, a wealth of, of knowledge. He knows where to find me and you know most of our experiments you know, are conducted in South Africa and Australia and Europe, California. And uh, we, we would love to see, you know, how uh, our products, whether it's Inacacastini or uh, some of our non-Saccharomyces yeast, you know, what the effect and, and impact is in, uh, in, in your wines. And so we're always uh, willing to, to, to work uh, with with universities, with with winemakers, to to learn, we're we're pretty humble and pretty open and sharing what we know, 
and 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 what we what we don't. And so I, I think this could be the start of a, a good good partnership. And I'm I'm looking forward to to learning more about um, one from Michigan and the Midwest and and how uh, we can work together to uh, improve uh, the the quality of of all all wines. You know and in classical regions and in emerging regions like like Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I was just hoping, you know, not, you know, I was hoping that if you could in like, you know, either one of you, Brian or David and a couple, if you have any advice for people for a successful malolactic fermentation. You yeah, covered yeah. some in this pretty, you know, you definitely covered nutrients, you know, you covered nutrients, you covered getting a good culture. Um, some other ones you could think of. I would say, uh, you know, don't take any shortcuts. I know a lot of uh, winemakers, especially here in, in California, think, oh, you know what, I can, I can save a couple of dollars. I'll just stretch. I'll use half of what I, I should. Um, but definitely be aware of that magic number. I think that's something that isn't talked about enough. Um, why you need a million cells per milliliter, we honestly don't know um, exactly why. Uh, maybe that's something that someone could, uh, could study at, at the university. Um, but, you know, I, I said it in the presentation, you know, is, is very, it's a very slow grower. And so, you know, at least be aware of, of the risks. And if you're going to um, inoculate um, with half of the recommended dose, you know, it might take you twice as, as long. And to you know, be aware of um, what your wine conditions are, what, you know, what inhibitory factors you're dealing with, which ones you can control, and, and what type of wine, you know, you want to, to make. And, the, the range of bacteria strains, you know, they're, they're tools that can, that can help you, um, but they're not going to be a, a silver bullet. You know, you need to uh, utilize your, your knowledge in, in other areas and you need to know your wine and experiment and, and, and that type of knowledge doesn't happen over, overnight. And so just to, to be aware of that. Yeah, kind of on that same plane of uh, knowing Kind of what you're starting with in terms of your your wine um, is it historically a problem ferment both primary and for mallow you know those are important factors you know on the nutrition side of things that's crucial um, following the nutrition path like knowing what you've got is extremely powerful you know whether you're doing enzymatic analysis on things or if you're doing an FTIR uh, like an enofos um, or um, you know, whatever else it is, if you're blanket adding nutrients, um, it, it, knowledge is really powerful. At that point. Uh, and, and both from a quality standpoint and from a cost standpoint, um, because you, you want to be able to have an efficient, fast ferment, both primary and mallow. Uh, but you also don't want to be going and, and just dumping unnecessary nutrients in if you don't need to. It's not good for your pocketbook. And it's certainly not good from a quality perspective to have a bunch of nutrition left over. Um, that a bunch of other bugs can start consuming, you know, and so it's that fine balance of, of understanding where you are and understanding where you want to go. And uh, I know something here, because I'm based in Minnesota, and, you know, Marquette came up in the conversation already. Marquette, typically you have yans at about 350, 400, right? So kind of insane when you think about it. Um, and so there are issues there with, with leftover nitrogen, you know, they're extremely breadth susceptible, for example. You know, uh, there's concerns about ethyl carbamate production, you know, um, but, you know, if you've got a Marquette at 400 yen, you really don't want to be adding any more nitrogen. You might need some, you know, vitamins or maybe yeast hulls or something like that. And maybe for your, your mallow fermentation, you might still need something that's, you know, not nitrogen based, of course. Um, but uh, knowing, having that knowledge is extremely useful and, and can save you a huge headache, uh, whether it's a microbial spoilage issue or you're, you're literally throwing money in the wet, uh, in, in, into the wine unnecessarily, or throwing it into time spent where it's not finished um, through mallow, you know, because 
you know, time is money, right? In some cases, and uh, you want to be able to get things done and dusted and put to bed and filtered and thrown in the bottle and on the shelf so people can buy it. Um, that's not always the case, um, you know. It certainly worked for places where primary fermentations went for a year, you know, <laughs> and that was just how it went. And you know, that's a that's a choice in its own right. Um, so keeping an eye on, on those things that are really important that are going to impact those, I think are, are really critical. Uh, and then of course, uh, I'm a huge fan of experimentation and, and trials. Um, so figuring out what works well for each wine that you're trying to work with um, is to me really, really, really important. Um, because if it might be one strain is good for your whole winery, you know, and that's cool. And there are a lot of wineries that do that. Uh, it might be this strain works well for this grape and that is it, you know, and that's cool too, but it might be so much better than the blanket approach that it's absolutely worth doing the trial and exploring, you know. Um, we did have one more question that popped in here. Uh, is it possible to add too much ML bacteria? Generally, no, uh, but it just gets expensive. Um, your mouth really fast, uh, but it's also self-limited by um, metabolic processes at, at some point there. But um, David, do you, do you want to jump in on that too? Yeah, I mean, from the literature that I've read, uh, there really is no beneficial effect of you know, adding more. It, it seems to be, you know, once you hit that magic number, uh, your, your, your speed is pretty much set. Uh, I, I do think the major concern uh, would be cost and, you know, waste of, of, of resources. I've certainly heard of stories of, you know, maybe interns adding twice as, as much bacteria than, than they should, um, but I haven't um, heard of any detrimental quality issues uh, because someone added too much bacteria to a wine. If you're adding too much bacteria and that's the only problem that you've got going through harvest. That's not double adding your sulfur or something like that. You know, you're in a good place. So, <laughs> and, and, and bugs are kind of like enzymes. Like there's generally not too much detrimental impact that's going to happen by double hitting a mallow inoculation or, or yeast inoculation for that matter. Um, yeah. You know, I was just going to kind of follow up and answer my own question. And I was just like three pretty simple things. For a malolactic fermentation, no SO2, right? No oxygen. Keep your containers full. And like an alcoholic, you can alcoholic, you can keep a container half full and it's not a problem. With the malolactic fermentation, you really don't have that much. In fact, you know, David, you were using the word conversion frequently, and that was what I was taught as well, because it's more, it is more of a conversion to fermentation, although a little bit of CO2 is mm -hmm. generated, but it's not enough to protect the wine from incoming oxygen and I've learned that the hard way um, and also temperature right you know you got a bug that's living there and so you know you got to keep the temperature room temperature would be nice 65 is nice I mean certainly above 60 um, and remember we're in Michigan ground freezes so if you can keep your cellars warmer do that because there's nothing quite like realizing it's 55 degrees in your cellar and you have no way to heat it that's, that's when the big plastic sheets and the space heaters come out. <laughs> oh, yeah. The warmth, the heat, everyone gets their own heating blanket. No, that, that works too. <laughs> the uh, the uh, insert little uh, aquarium heaters. I've done those over the years too. Yeah, yeah, I've done that. that. Yeah, <laughs> you have all these cords. And, yep. You know, yeah. Yep. That's yeah. genius. I they work. Get down. <laughs> they, they work. They totally work. In, in Alsace, we had what we called the octopus, which was the, these, it was a water cooling system that you could insert into fooders and barrels and things like that. And it had eight arms. And so you could either do hot or, or cool if you wanted things to go through mallow or just to stop fermenting or whatever it was. So. All right, duct taping waterbed heater blankets around the side <laughs> outside of the tank. I've done that before too. <laughs> That's solid. That was my first internship. That was, yeah, I remember doing that. And they'd fall off, you know, they'd fall, the duct tape wouldn't hold them on strong enough. So they'd try to put more duct tape on there. Sure. Anyways. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everyone. And again, um, 
feel free if you have any other questions um, for me or for David, um, you can certainly reach out to me. Uh, of course, Michael and Amy, um, you're already connected with them. Um, Thank excellent. you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Have a good day.